Book three, section twenty four of On Duties by Cicero, translated by Walter Miller. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Edwards. Twenty four. The question arises also whether agreements and promises must always be kept, when, in the language of the praetor's edicts, they have not been secured through force or criminal fraud. If one man gives another a remedy for the dropsy, with the stipulation that if he is cured by it he shall never make use of it again, suppose the patient's health is restored by the use of it, but some years later he contracts the same disease once more and suppose he cannot secure from the man with whom he made the agreement permission to use the remedy again what should he do that is the question since the man is unfeeling in refusing the request and since no harm could be done to him by his friends using the remedy the sick man is justified in doing what he can for his own life and health again suppose that a millionaire is making some wise man his heir and leaving him in his will a hundred million sesterces and suppose that he has asked the wise man before he enters upon his inheritance to dance publicly in broad daylight in the forum and suppose that the wise man has given his promise to do so because the rich man would not leave him his fortune on any other condition should he keep his promise or not i wish he had made no such promise that i think would have been in keeping with his dignity but seeing that he has made it it will be morally better for him if he believes it morally wrong to dance in the forum to break his promise and refuse to accept his inheritance rather than to keep his promise and accept it unless perhaps he contributes the money to the state to meet some grave crisis in that case to promote thereby the interests of one's country it would not be morally wrong even to dance if you please in the forum twenty five no more binding are those promises which are inexpedient for the persons themselves to whom they have been given to go back to the realm of story the sun-god promised his son phaethon to do for him whatever he should wish his wish was to be allowed to ride in his father's chariot it was granted and before he came back to the ground he was consumed by a stroke of lightning how much better had it been if in his case the father's promise had not been kept and what of that promise the fulfilment of which theseus required from neptune when neptune offered him three wishes he wished for the death of his son hippolytus because the father was suspicious of the son's relations with his stepmother and when this wish was granted theseus was overwhelmed with grief and once more when agamemnon had vowed to diana the most beautiful creature born that year within his realm he was brought to sacrifice iphigenia for in that year nothing was born more beautiful than she he ought to have broken his vow rather than commit so horrible a crime promises are therefore sometimes not to be kept and trusts are not always to be restored suppose that a person leaves his sword with you when he is in his right mind and demands it back in a fit of insanity it would be criminal to restore it to him it would be your duty not to do so again suppose that a man who has entrusted money to you proposes to make war upon your common country should you restore the trust i believe you should not for you would be acting against the state which ought to be the dearest thing in the world to you thus there are many things which in and of themselves seem morally right but which under certain circumstances prove to be not morally right to keep a promise to abide by an agreement to restore a trust may with a change of expediency cease to be morally right with this i think i have said enough about those actions which masquerade as expedient under the guise of prudence while they are really contrary to justice since however in book one we derived moral duties from the four sources of moral rectitude let us continue the same fourfold division here in pointing out how hostile to virtue are those courses of conduct which seem to be but really are not expedient we have discussed wisdom which cunning seeks to counterfeit and likewise justice which is always expedient 
there remain for our discussion two divisions of moral rectitude the one of which is discernible in the greatness and pre-eminence of a superior soul the other in the shaping and regulation of it by temperance and self-control twenty six ulysses thought his ruse expedient as the tragic poets at least have represented him in homer our most reliable authority no such suspicion is cast upon him but the tragedies charge him with trying to escape a soldier's service by feigning madness the trick was not morally right but some one may perhaps say it was expedient for him to keep his throne and live at ease in ithaca with parents wife and son do you think that there is any glory in facing daily toil and danger that can be compared with a life of such tranquillity nay i think that tranquillity at such a price is to be despised and rejected for if it is not morally right neither is it expedient for what do you think would have been said of ulysses if he had persisted in that pretended madness seeing that notwithstanding his deeds of heroism in the war he was nevertheless upbraided by ajax thus twas he himself who first proposed the oath ye all do know yet he alone of all his vow did break he feigned persistently that he was mad that thus he might not have to join the host and had not then palamedes shrewd and wise his tricky impudence unmasked he had evaded in for i his vow nay for him it had been better to battle not only with the enemy but also with the waves as he did than to desert greece when she was united for waging the war against the barbarians but let us leave illustrations both from story and from foreign lands and turn to real events in our own history marcus attilius regulus in his second consulship was taken prisoner in africa by the stratagem of xanthippus a spartan general serving under the command of hannibal's father hamilcar he was sent to the senate on parole sworn to return to carthage himself if certain noble prisoners of war were not restored to the carthaginians when he came to rome he could not fail to see the specious appearance of expediency but he decided that it was unreal as the outcome proves his apparent interest was to remain in his own country to stay at home with his wife and children and to retain his rank and dignity as an ex-consul regarding the defeat which he had suffered as a misfortune that might come to any one in the game of war who says that this was not expedient who think you greatness of soul and courage say that it was not twenty seven can you ask for more competent authorities the denial comes from those virtues for it is characteristic of them to await nothing with fear to rise superior to all the vicissitudes of earthly life and to count nothing intolerable that can befall a human being what then did he do he came into the senate and stated his mission but he refused to give his own vote on the question for he held he was not a member of the senate so long as he was bound by the oath sworn to his enemies and more than that he said what a foolish fellow some one will say to oppose his own best interests he said that it was not expedient that the prisoners should be returned for they were young men and gallant officers while he was already bowed with age and when his counsel prevailed the prisoners were retained and he himself returned to carthage affection for his country and his family failed to hold him back and even then he was not ignorant of the fact that he was going to a most cruel enemy and to exquisite torture still he thought his oath must be sacredly kept and so even then when he was being slowly put to death by enforced wakefulness he enjoyed a happier lot than if he had remained at home an aged prisoner of war a man of consular rank forsworn but you will say it was foolish of him not only not to advocate the exchange of prisoners but even to plead against such action how was it foolish was it so even if his policy was for the good of the state nay can what is inexpedient for the state be expedient for any individual citizen twenty eight people overturn the fundamental principles established by nature when they divorce expediency from moral rectitude for we all seek to obtain what is to us expedient 
we are irresistibly drawn toward it, and we cannot possibly be otherwise. For who is there that would turn his back upon what is to him expedient? Or rather, who is there that does not exert himself to the utmost to secure it? But because we cannot discover it anywhere except in good report, propriety, and moral rectitude, we look upon these three for that reason as the first and the highest objects of endeavor, while what we term expediency we account not so much an ornament to our dignity as a necessary incident to living. What significance, then, someone will say, do we attach to an oath? It is not that we fear the wrath of Jove, is it? Not at all. It is the universally accepted view of all philosophers that God is never angry, never hurtful. This is the doctrine not only of those who teach that God is himself free from troubling cares, and that he imposes no trouble upon others, but also of those who believe that God is ever working and ever directing his world. Furthermore, suppose Jupiter had been wroth, what greater injury could he have inflicted upon Regulus than Regulus brought upon himself? Religious scruple, therefore, had no such preponderance as to outweigh so great expediency. Or was he afraid that his act would be morally wrong? As to that, first of all, the proverb says, Of evils choose the least. Did that moral wrong, then, really involve as great an evil as did that awful torture? And secondly, there are the lines of Axius. Thyestes, hast thou broken thy faith? Atreus, none have I given, none give I ever to the faithless. Although this sentiment is put into the mouth of a wicked king, still it is illuminating in its correctness. Their third argument is this. Just as we maintain that some things seem expedient but are not, so, they maintain, some things seem morally right but are not. For example, they contend, in this very case it seems morally right for Regulus to have returned to torture for the sake of being true to his oath, but it proves not to be morally right, because what an enemy extorted by force ought not to have been binding. As their concluding argument they add, whatever is highly expedient may prove to be morally right, even if it did not seem so in advance. These are in substance the arguments raised against the conduct of Regulus. Let us consider them each in turn. 29. He need not have been afraid that Jupiter in anger would inflict injury upon him. He is not wont to be angry or hurtful. This argument, at all events, has no more weight against Regulus's conduct than it has against the keeping of any other oath. But, in taking an oath, it is our duty to consider not what one may have to fear in case of violation, but wherein its obligation lies. An oath is an assurance backed by religious sanctity, and a solemn promise given, as before God as one's witness, is to be sacredly kept. For the question no longer concerns the wrath of the gods, for there is no such thing, but the obligations of justice and good faith. For, as Ennius says so admirably, Gracious good faith, on wings upborne, thou oath in Jupiter's great name. Whoever, therefore, violates his oath, violates good faith. And, as we find it stated in Cato's speech, our forefathers chose that she should dwell upon the capital, neighbor to Jupiter supreme and best. But, objection was further made, even if Jupiter had been angry, he could not have inflicted greater injury upon Regulus than Regulus brought upon himself. Quite true, if there is no evil except pain. But philosophers of the highest authority assure us that pain is not only not the supreme evil, but no evil at all. And pray, do not disparage Regulus as no unimportant witness. Nay, I am rather inclined to think he was the very best witness to the truth of their doctrine. For what more competent witness do we ask for than one of the foremost citizens of Rome, who voluntarily faced torture for the sake of being true to his moral duty? Again, they say, of evils choose the least. That is, shall one choose moral wrong rather than misfortune? Or is there any evil greater than moral wrong? For if physical deformity excites a certain amount of aversion, how offensive ought the deformity and hideousness of a demoralized soul to seem. Therefore, 
those who discuss these problems with more rigor make bold to say that moral wrong is the only evil while those who treat them with more laxity do not hesitate to call it the supreme evil once more they quote the sentiment none have i given none give i ever to the faithless it was proper for the poet to say that because when he was working out his atreus he had to make the words fit the character but if they mean to adopt it as a principle that a pledge given to the faithless is no pledge let them look to it that it be not a mere loophole for perjury that they seek furthermore we have laws regulating warfare and fidelity to an oath must often be observed in dealings with an enemy for an oath sworn with the clear understanding in one's own mind that it should be performed must be kept but if there is no such understanding it does not count as perjury if one does not perform the vow for example suppose that one does not deliver the amount agreed upon with pirates as the price of one's life that would be accounted no deception not even if one should fail to deliver the ransom after having sworn to do so for a pirate is not included in the number of lawful enemies but is the common foe of all the world and with him there ought not to be any pledged word nor any oath mutually binding for swearing to what is false is not necessarily perjury but to take an oath upon your conscience as it is expressed in our legal formulas and then fail to perform it that is perjury for euripides aptly says my tongue has sworn the mind i have has sworn no oath but regulus had no right to confound by perjury the terms and covenants of war made with an enemy for the war was being carried on with a legitimate declared enemy and to regulate our dealings with such an enemy we have our whole official code as well as many other laws that are binding in common between nations were this not the case the senate would never have delivered up illustrious men of ours in chains to the enemy thirty and yet that very thing happened titus vetudius and spudius postumius in their second consulship lost the battle at the caudine forks and our legions were sent under the yoke and because they made peace with the samnites those generals were delivered up to them for they had made the peace without the approval of the people and senate and tiberius numicius and quintus milius tribunes of the people were delivered up at the same time because it was with their sanction that the peace had been concluded this was done in order that the peace with the samnites might be annulled and postumius the very man whose delivery was in question was the proposer and advocate of the said delivery many years later gaius mancinus had a similar experience he advocated the bill introduced in accordance with the decree of the senate by lucius fudius and sextus attilius that he should be delivered up to the numentines with whom he had made a treaty without authorization from the senate and when the bill was passed he was delivered up to the enemy his action was more honourable than quintus pompey's pompey's situation was identical with his and yet at his own entreaty the bill was rejected in this latter case apparent expediency prevailed over moral rectitude in the former cases the false semblance of expediency was overbalanced by the weight of moral rectitude but they argued against regulus an oath extorted by force ought not to have been binding as if force could be brought to bear upon a brave man why then did he make the journey to the senate especially when he intended to plead against the surrender of the prisoners of war therein you are criticizing what is the noblest feature of his conduct for he was not content to stand upon his own judgment but took up the case in order that the judgment might be that of the senate and had it not been for the weight of his pleading the prisoners would certainly have been restored to the carthaginians and in that case regulus would have remained safe at home in his country but because he thought this not expedient for his country he believed that it was therefore morally right for him to declare his conviction and to suffer for it when they argued also that what is highly expedient may prove to be morally right they ought rather to say not that it may prove to be but that it actually is morally right for nothing can be expedient 
which is not at the same time morally right neither can a thing be morally right just because it is expedient but it is expedient because it is morally right from the many splendid examples in history therefore we could not easily point to one either more praiseworthy or more heroic than the conduct of regulus thirty one but of all that is thus praiseworthy in the conduct of regulus this one feature above all others calls for our admiration it was he who offered the motion that the prisoners of war be retained for the fact of his returning may seem admirable to us nowadays but in those times he could not have done otherwise that merit therefore belongs to the age not to the man for our ancestors were of the opinion that no bond was more effective in guaranteeing good faith than an oath that is clearly proved by the laws of the twelve tables by the sacred laws by the treaties in which good faith is pledged even to the enemy by the investigations made by the censors and the penalties imposed by them for there were no cases in which they used to render more rigorous decisions than in cases of violation of an oath marcus pomponius a tribune of the people brought an indictment against lucius manlius aulus's son for having extended the term of his dictatorship a few days beyond its expiration he further charged him with having banished his own son titus afterward surnamed torquatus from all companionship with his fellow-men and with requiring him to live in the country when the son who was then a young man heard that his father was in trouble on his account he hastened to rome so the story goes and at daybreak presented himself at the house of pomponius the visitor was announced to pomponius inasmuch as he thought that the son in his anger meant to bring him some new evidence to use against the father he arose from his bed asked all who were present to leave the room and sent word to the young man to come in upon entering he at once drew a sword and swore that he would kill the tribune on the spot if he did not swear an oath to withdraw the suit against his father constrained by the terror of the situation pomponius gave his oath he reported the matter to the people explaining why he was obliged to drop the prosecution and withdrew his suit against manlius such was the regard for the sanctity of an oath in those days and that lad was the titus manlius who in the battle on the anio killed the gaul by whom he had been challenged to single combat pulled off his torque and thus won his surname and in his third consulship he routed the latins and put them to flight in the battle on the wasseries he was one of the greatest of the great and one who while more than generous toward his father could yet be bitterly severe toward his son thirty two now as regulus deserves praise for being true to his oath so those ten whom hannibal sent to the senate on parole after the battle of cannae deserve censure if it is true that they did not return for they were sworn to return to the camp which had fallen into the hands of the carthaginians if they did not succeed in negotiating an exchange of prisoners historians are not in agreement in regard to the facts polybius one of the very best authorities states that of the ten eminent nobles who were sent at that time nine returned when their mission failed at the hands of the senate but one of the ten who a little while after leaving the camp had gone back on the pretext that he had forgotten something or other remained behind at rome he explained that by his return to the camp he was released from the obligation of his oath he was wrong for deceit does not remove the guilt of perjury it merely aggravates it his cunning that impudently tried to masquerade as prudence was therefore only folly and so the senate ordered that the cunning scoundrel should be taken back to hannibal in chains but the most significant part of the story is this the eight thousand prisoners in hannibal's hands were not men that he had taken in the battle or that had escaped in the peril of their lives but men that the consuls paulus and Waro had left behind in camp though these might have been ransomed by a small sum of money the senate voted not to redeem them in order that our soldiers might have the lesson planted in their hearts that they must either conquer or die when hannibal heard this news according to that same writer he lost heart completely 
because the senate and the people of rome displayed courage so lofty in a time of disaster thus apparent expediency is outweighed when placed in the balance against moral rectitude gaius achilius on the other hand the author of a history of rome in greek says that there were several who played the same trick of returning to the camp to release themselves thus from the obligation of their oath and that they were branded by the censors with every mark of disgrace let this be the conclusion of this topic for it must be perfectly apparent that acts that are done with a cowardly craven abject broken spirit as the act of regulus would have been if he had supported in regard to the prisoners a measure that seemed to be advantageous for him personally but disadvantageous for the state or if he had consented to remain at home that such acts are not expedient because they are shameful dishonourable and immoral thirty three we have still left our fourth division comprising propriety moderation temperance self-restraint self-control can anything be expedient then which is contrary to such a chorus of virtues and yet the cyrenaics adherents of the school of aristippus and the philosophers who bear the name of aniketes find all good to consist in pleasure and consider virtue praiseworthy only because it is productive of pleasure now that these schools are out of date epicurus has come into vogue an advocate and supporter of practically the same doctrine against such a philosophy we must fight it out with horse and foot as the saying is if our purpose is to defend and maintain our standard of moral rectitude for if as we find it in the writings of metrodorus not only expediency but happiness in life depends wholly upon a sound physical constitution and the reasonable expectation that it will always remain sound then that expediency and what is more the highest expediency as they estimate it will assuredly clash with moral rectitude for first of all what position will wisdom occupy in that system the position of collector of pleasures from every possible source what a sorry state of servitude for a virtue to be pandering to sensual pleasure and what will be the function of wisdom to make skilful choice between sensual pleasures granted that there may be nothing more pleasant what can be conceived more degrading for wisdom than such a role then again if any one hold that pain is the supreme evil what place in his philosophy has fortitude which is but indifference to toil and pain for however many passages there are in which epicurus speaks right manfully of pain we must nevertheless consider not what he says but what is consistent for a man to say who has defined the good in terms of pleasure and evil in terms of pain and further if i should listen to him i should find that in many passages he has a great deal to say about temperance and self-control but the water will not run as they say for how can he commend self-control and yet posit pleasure as the supreme good for self-control is the foe of the passions and the passions are the handmaids of pleasure and yet when it comes to these three cardinal virtues those philosophers shift and turn as best they can and not without cleverness they admit wisdom into their system as the knowledge that provides pleasure and banishes pain they clear the way for fortitude also in some way to fit in with their doctrines when they teach that it is a rational means for looking with indifference upon death and for enduring pain they bring even temperance in not very easily to be sure but still as best they can for they hold that the height of pleasure is found in the absence of pain justice totters or rather i should say lies already prostrate so also with all those virtues which are discernible in social life and the fellowship of human society for neither goodness nor generosity nor courtesy can exist any more than friendship can if they are not sought of and for themselves but are cultivated only for the sake of sensual pleasure or personal advantage let us now recapitulate briefly as i have shown that such expediency as is opposed to moral rectitude is no expediency so i maintain that any and all sensual pleasure is opposed to moral rectitude and therefore caliphon and denomachos in my judgment deserve the greater condemnation they imagined 
that they should settle the controversy by coupling pleasure with moral rectitude as well yoke a man with a beast but moral rectitude does not accept such a union she abhors it spurns it why the supreme good which ought to be simple cannot be a compound and mixture of absolutely contradictory qualities but this theory i have discussed more fully in another connection for the subject is a large one now for the matter before us we have then fully discussed the problem how a question is to be decided if ever that which seems to be expediency clashes with moral rectitude but if on the other hand the assertion is made that pleasure admits of a show of expediency also there can still be no possible union between it and moral rectitude for to make the most generous admission we can in favour of pleasure we will grant that it may contribute something that possibly gives some spice to life but certainly nothing that is really expedient herewith my son marcus you have a present from your father a generous one in my humble opinion but its value will depend upon the spirit in which you receive it and yet you must welcome these three books as fellow guests so to speak along with your notes on Kratipos's lectures but as you would sometimes give ear to me also if i had come to athens and i should be there now if my country had not called me back with accents unmistakable when i was halfway there so you will please devote as much time as you can to these volumes for in them my voice will travel to you and you can devote to them as much time as you will and when i see that you take delight in this branch of philosophy i shall then talk further with you at an early date i hope face to face but as long as you are abroad i shall converse with you thus at a distance farewell my dear cicero and be assured that while you are the object of my deepest affection you will be dearer to me still if you find pleasure in such counsel and instruction end of book three and end of on duties by cicero translated by walter miller read by geoffrey edwards proof listened by felipe vogel